Let's bring our conversations to a close. Hopefully we're meeting some new pals at our tables. Uh, a couple of things I forgot to say in the first part. Um, I just want to give, we want to give a big thank you to our sponsors. Yep, yep, big thank you. So they have a table in the back. It's Red Orange Studio, Favre Group Real Estate, and Endorphin Fitness. So houses and exercise. Thanks so much for bringing this to us. No, but seriously, grateful to our sponsors. Um, so we're going to call up our next um, our first speaker, actually, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my phone. I'm so out of practice because we've been in a pandemic for the past 18 months. Also, my eyes have gotten weaker in the past, like, eight, I'm literally just trying not to hold it to my face. Uh, so we have Patricia Clark coming up. And let me tell you, I know um, all these speakers I've met at least once, just about all of them, in some way, shape, or form. And I've heard Patricia Clark teach the Bible in such a way that I just was fascinated and I just was keyed in the entire time. She teaches the Bible so well, so beautifully, with such God-given authority. And she's going to frame uh, our theology of work today. And even just, um, I don't know Patricia very well, but even in our interactions, she has such an encouraging heart, a supportive spirit. She's very, like, calming and soothing. So as we listen to her bring forth God's word as it pertains to work and being people, especially women of faith, I just feel like you guys, it's just going to allow it to fall on good ground. So Patricia... Uh, has been teaching the Bible for the past 20 years. She has a myriad of degrees and is pursuing another one at, at Fuller Theological Seminary right now as we speak. I'm telling you, I've been to seminary. I dropped out. It is not a good time. <laughs> like, so God bless her for being here doing another event. Um, and so when, asked, when I asked Patricia, I said, Patricia, if you could uh, do any karaoke song that you want, like, if, and you know you're going to shut it down, she said that she would do Live Your Life by T.I. So I can't wait to hear that. She's going to do that for us right now. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> would you welcome her as she comes? Give her a big round of applause. <laughs> hey, y'all. Good to see you. The reason I said Live Your Life is because I am so bad at singing. My whole family makes fun of me, so I figure if I can dance, that might like distract from the singing. So... All right, well, I'm so happy to be here with you all, and as I was driving here, I thought, you know, I don't know so many of you, even though I do know some of you, and I know you're in the same boat, and whenever you go someplace new, you sort of want to put on a little bit of a guarded mask, not just physically, but like emotionally, because you're having to meet new people Saturday morning, and I just want to invite all of us to just roll your shoulders back, take a deep breath. And let's just drop the mask and be just who you are today. The people who are at your table, God has put there for you to connect with. So just be you, be authentic. Work is a very broad term. Some of you are making big paychecks. Some of you are just trying to make ends meet. Some of you are retired. Some of you are working without a paycheck, but you're contributing to the world. So just be who you are. And that's the gift that we can give each other. Let's get started. Okay, I want to start with a story because I love stories. And this story is about a young woman in 1996. And she is standing at the edge of a driveway in a desolate place alone. And the reason she's standing there is this young woman is a landscaper. And her name is Patricia Clark. And she's in her early 20s. And she's been dropped there alone with a task to do by her crew driver. And the task that she has from 8.30 in the morning to 5, as she looks down this long driveway, is to weed the driveway. That's all she has to do all day. It's a beautiful place. It's near the ocean. And the driveway is white seashells, which are kind of painful when you're kneeling on them. But that's her job. And she's looking at it, and she's thinking, all right, this is what I got to do today. Does she want to do it? No. Do her legs hurt from all the hard work? Yes. But this is what she has. And what I want to talk about today is what does that day, what does a day in your life, in your work, have to do with life? What is the point for her as she's looking at that driveway? What is the point of what I'm doing? If you are a person of faith, 
What does your faith have to do with me weeding the driveway? What does your faith have to do with what you do during the week? The emails you sent, the reports you fill out, the cases you defend, the medicine, the teaching, whatever you do, the artistry that you make. Wherever you are, what does what we do, the worship we do on Sunday morning, how does that connect and relate to what we do during the week? And I think the church has done a a disservice to all of us, and this is a disservice that has been historically a part of the church for years, years. Um, back in ancient times, it was called the um, Manichean heresy. I think I'm getting that right. But it's basically, there was a heresy where people were saying the physical world doesn't matter, only the spiritual world. The physical world doesn't matter, only the spiritual world. Well, I'm here to tell you today in explaining the theology of work, which is basically a fancy term for how does faith, how does Sunday morning fit with Monday morning? How does that work? Well, it's a heresy to think that the spiritual work, the people in mission work, the people who stand up at the pulpit are the ones that really matter, and what I do during the week doesn't matter to God. That's a heresy, because the physical world matters. Now, we're a part of the physical world. Our souls matter, but the physical work that we're doing in the world matter. And I want to give you a sweep of scripture today to help you understand that, that's just going to lay the groundwork for all these awesome stories that are coming up today. So I would like you to take out a piece of paper, your journals and pens, and I want you to answer this question. What is your line of work? What is your line of work? Real brief. And if you're not making a paycheck, do not give me that lip because I know you're working your butt off Monday through Friday. I was a little insecure about coming here because I don't make much of a paycheck, <laughs> if, if any at all. So uh, I don't know why I'm speaking to the marketplace, but here I am. So wherever you are, bring what you got. What do you do during the week? Just give it a word or two. And the truth I want to say to you today is what you're doing Monday through Friday, your line of work, because of the grace of Jesus Christ, is a part of God's line of work. Your line of work, what you do with your hands, what you do with your mind, what you do with your skills, what you do with your talent, even if it doesn't have the name of Jesus on it, even though you're not praying and reading your Bible, even though you're not fellowshipping, what you're doing, the weeding of the driveway, your line of work is a part of God's bigger line of work in the earth. I'm going to draw a line here, and this is God's storyline through history. It goes before time and extends after time, but there are four movements that I want to describe for you. And you can remember these movements with the letter B. And this is the story of God's line of work as told through the Bible. First, in Genesis, God says, I created people in my image in my image, he created them, and he blessed them. And then included in that blessing was a command to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And the main point I want you to know about this period of blessing, which is in the beginning of the Bible, is that work was a part of the blessing. So God has given each one of us skills and talents and unique wirings, and when we use those, to bring about goodness in the world, to cultivate, to create, to manage, to manufacture, to distribute, to create new products, to do all that we do, that you're uniquely designed to do, there is blessing in that, and there is joy, and that was before the brokenness came. Which brings us to the second dot, which is brokenness. And what happened here? Before the brokenness, God was with us and dwelling with us, and we were in communion with him, and we were in communion with each other, and things were all beautiful. There's beauty all around us. And what happened is we were not satisfied with being made in the image of God. We wanted to be God. Before, we trusted in our heart that what God said was good and was right and the blessed way to live we were in sync with that. And when we decided that we actually wanted to be God, this line was broken and we all started going in our different ways. 
And what happened is we said, God, what you say is good, I don't trust. I trust what I feel is good. And when we're all doing what we feel is good, there is trouble. If everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, there is trouble. And like a bad seed that grows, it just spread throughout humanity, like a DNA virus that went from person to person throughout history, through families, and it just spread and got worse and worse. We wanted to be God, and the way I remember that is that there are thorns and thistles everywhere you look. God made us to be fruitful, which is beautiful and nourishing, and there's a blessing in that, but right next to the fruit are the thorns and thistles. And I was telling Jennifer that this morning that That was encouraging for me to learn because I think at some level, we idealize that on this earth, we're going to arrive at a place where our work will not be hard. If we do it the right way, if we pray enough, if we do all the right things, that we're going to arrive at a place where the people we work with don't get on our nerves, where our boss isn't getting on our nerves and being overreaching and is asked. But that's not going to happen. The thorns and thistles will always be there. And sometimes the thorns and thistles come from outside of us, in the systems, in the workplaces where we are. And sometimes the thorns and thistles come from inside of us because of the things we bring to the table. But guess what? In the story of God, we cannot go anywhere outside of his reach. Where you are in your job, whether it fits you or not, whether it's a good match for your skills and talents, whether you're finding your passion there, wherever you are, maybe you're just trying to make ends meet because you got a family to feed. Maybe you're a single mom and you're exhausted at work and you're exhausted at home, but I'm here to tell you that you can go nowhere where the grace of Jesus Christ is not sufficient for you. Hear me in that. You go to work and it's hard, the thorns and thistles are there. And guess what, a part of this brokenness, and I was reading about it, I was like, well, dag on. You go home and then it's hard with your children if you have children, or maybe you wanna have children and you can't, or it's hard with your spouse, and, or maybe you wanna have a spouse, because the thistles show up when you get home too, right? The thorns and thistles show up there. But I'm telling you today, no matter what your home life is, no matter whether you have children or don't, whether you're married or not, no matter what your work life is, the grace of God is here in abundance for you today. You can go nowhere where the blessing of God will not reach you, where the grace of God will not reach you. And the beautiful thing about this story is that the brokenness, the thistles and the thorns, rather than taking us away from God, The next part of the story is the blood, the blood of Jesus. And because of the thorns and thistles in our life, rather than them ruining our jobs and ruining our families, we bring those broken places under the blood of Jesus, and he turns them into a place of healing and beauty. So we don't have to become perfect. We don't have to get it right. We bring our brokenness, which will always be a part of you. It will always be a part of where you are. It will always be a part of your family. Don't believe the lie that you will get there. Because if we get, try and get there on our own, we miss the blood of Jesus. We miss the beauty of Jesus. And it is in our brokenness that we come under the blood of Jesus. And when we do that, we are reconciled to God. And that is where the beauty begins. In Revelations, it talks about the end. We started in a garden, and it ends in a city. And the city is described as a beautiful bride. That means a collection of people working, yes, still working, in the new heavens and the new earth, with our talents no longer having thorns and thistles, with our talents and our skills and our family and our connection and our communities no longer having thorns and thistles that are choking us out. Why? Because the blood of Jesus has taken that which is broken and redeemed it and made us into places that of healing. Our brokenness is what actually leads to the community and the love that we have for each other. We've taken down our mass of perfection and performance and getting it all right. And we show our brokenness, we show the wounds because we're in Christ. It's our wounds that bring us together. It's our wounds that we have in common in Jesus Christ. So what does this mean when we find ourselves out here living amongst the thorns and the thistles? When we find that what you're doing in your line of work, what you're doing in your line of work doesn't feel like it's in keeping with God's line of work? Well, 
We turn to the blood of Jesus and we repent. And here's what I want you to think about today. I want you to think about your vocation that you wrote on that card. And I want you to consider what are the job hazards in your vocation? What are the job hazards? And what I mean by hazards, I mean the spiritual hazards that are causing you to think, I want to be God. I'm not going to trust God. I'm going to be God. And I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes. And every field has your own unique hazard, your own unique set of idols that you want to worship that bring glory to you instead of glory to God. Maybe in your job, everyone around you, the ultimate success is making a lot of money. Maybe it's having a certain position. Maybe if you're in the nonprofit world, it's making the most impact and working the hardest. Maybe if you're um, in um, some kind of artistry, it's like creating, having enough followers or fame. Whatever the idols are in your world, y'all, they seep in like weeds. They seep in and they start to choke out the fruit, the love of Jesus. And you guys, we can repent of those. And it happens so slow. You know, with a compass, if you if you turn your foot one degree to the right and walk in that way over years, you're way off the path. And some of us, it happens so slow because we're walking with other people who are worshiping not our God, but other gods, the gods of our vocation. And it happens over time and it seeps in. And today we need the Holy Spirit to convict us and remind us who is our true God. And the way we get back is that we remember that those gods will not be the one who brings us life. In the beginning, God is a source of life. He is the one who breathes life into us. Those are false gods. They are not places where we find abundant life. We remind ourselves that the lifeline is in God's work. The lifeline, we return our line of work to the lifeline, the source of life. Some of us might be tempted in our line of work to think that we're not significant and we get discouraged. But I'm here to tell you that that's not the storyline of the Bible. The storyline of the Bible is that you are redeemed by the blood of the lamb, you are blessed, and nothing about this broken world and this broken system can keep God from using you. You bring yourself into the storyline of the Bible. You know, my job when I was weeding the driveway, you know what happened to me? I was so discouraged, and discouragement is a sign that we are leaving the work of God because we've forgotten the storyline that what we do matters. And what I did in that moment, I thought, dag on it, if I'm going to have to do this, I am going to embrace the task that I despise. And every single one of us has tasks every week that we despise. And what I'm telling you I did is I said, I am going to do this driveway to the best of my ability. And when I was done, it was beautiful. And it brought me satisfaction. And if I had done that driveway half-heartedly and in resentment for my boss for dropping me off there, I would have had a miserable day. But I believed in the overall beauty and work that God had given me. And I did it unto him, unto the glory of the Lord. And so the tasks that you are called to do, whether they're your passion or not, we are invited to see them as a part of a bigger mission of God renewing all things, renewing all things, not just souls, but the earth, the physical earth. We are invited to be a part of that journey. And when we join in God's line of work, it brings us joy, it brings us satisfaction, and it raises us up from being discouraged and feeling doubts about ourselves. So wherever you are today in your work, I just invite you to listen to these stories, to receive them, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will help you have a renewed vision for what you do during the week and how to incorporate your faith into your work. Thanks, everyone.